It's my privilege to introduce a very special presenter today at the Wednesday afternoon lecture, which is also one of the NIH director's lectures. And as the NIH director, I get the treat of being able to introduce the speaker. And today, uh, we're fortunate to have uh, Tom Sudhoff with us, who's going to speak about the molecular logic of neural circuits. Uh, born in Göttingen, uh, he then pursued an MD degree at the University of Göttingen Medical School. And not long after that, came to the United States, uh, where he carried out a postdoctoral fellowship uh, at uh, UT Southwestern Medical Center in the laboratory of none other than Brown and Goldstein. Not a bad place to sort of get your momentum going. Uh, somewhere in there, uh, he I moved in a direction different than they did. And so he's not going to talk to you about cholesterol, I don't think. Uh, he's going to talk about neuroscience, which is where he has made a remarkable series of advances over those years at UT Southwestern arising to become chair of the Department of Neuroscience, and then since 2008 as the Avram Goldstein Professor, Department of Molecular and Cellular Physiology at Stanford. And many of you know his name particularly because of the remarkable achievements and awards, including the Lasker DeBakey Medical Basic Science Award in 2013, and then right after that, uh, that same year, the Nobel Prize in physiology or medicine, shared with James Rothman and Randy Sheckman uh, for his work on the machinery involved in vesicle traffic. But in this case, the vesicles he's been particularly involved in are the ones I'm sure he's going to talk about today, which involve uh, synapses. His work has continually added to our understanding of how synapses form and function and the role of various molecules in making that happen, and increasingly also shedding light on critical issues about autism and schizophrenia and how this may all be tied together in a better understanding of the synapse. And just as we are at the moment in a very exciting time of beginning to unravel some of the mysteries of the brain, and certainly we at NIH deeply engaged in this uh, as part of the brain initiative, uh, the work that he is going to talk about is fundamental uh, to putting together those kinds of insights, understanding how these critical properties function both in health and disease. So we're fortunate indeed to have a Nobel laureate here this afternoon, and uh, I please would ask you all now to welcome uh, Professor Thomas Sudoff. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a true pleasure and honor for me to be here. Thank you very much for your kind remarks. Uh, sometimes when I hear the story of my life repeated, it makes me almost feel old. It seems like everything was yesterday. Um, what I'm going to talk about today, as indicated by the title, regards the fundamental question of how nerve cells are connected into networks by synapses. But before I start, let me list my disclosures. You can see them here. None of the stuff I'm going to talk about has anything to do with what I do as an advisor either to academic institutions or to various companies. So what I'm going to talk about today is a project or a series of projects that is really at the beginning, as far as I can see, something where we are trying to make the initial insights into how it works. And I wanted to uh, explain this a little bit to you, what the actual problem is. Obviously, this is a human brain, a dead human brain. And it always amazes me to consider how large the human brain is. There's trillions and trillions of neurons that are connected by billions of synapses, creating vast overlapping interdigitated networks that are communicating with each other. When you compare that to the human genome, whose sequencing Francis contributed so much to. It is actually quite amazing how much 
bigger, the brain is, than the genome. Initially, when we all saw the genome sequence, we thought, my God, we're going to understand the human genome. <laughs> that didn't last very long. Uh, we now know that understanding the human genome is much more than just having the sequence, although it was an absolutely essential prerequisite. Similarly, for the brain, it will be very difficult to understand how it works just from mapping, let's say, the neurons and their connections, although it will be a prerequisite. It is clear when you look at these numbers, however, that you won't be able to understand the brain as a simple linear function of the genes. As everything in biology, this has to be an indirect nonlinear relationship. Understanding the brain is arguably the most challenging goal we have now in biomedical research. But we, in the neuroscience community, have very different opinions about how best to approach such an understanding. Despite these opinions, I think everything converges onto the concept of neural circuits. What is a neural circuit? What you see here is a very simplified view of a neural circuit illustrating that a circuit is formed by neurons that are connected by synapses. Synapses are junctions, intercellular junctions that are specialized for the transfer of information and also, maybe more importantly, for the processing, the computation of that information. Synapses are the fundamental computational unit of the brain. In doing so, synapses are not the same but depend very much on the precise nature of the pre- and postsynaptic neuron and on the history of their connection. All synapses operate by the same fundamental principle, but the differences between synapses are as essential for understanding how circuits process information, as is the wiring diagram that depicts where the synapses are. We need to gain a fundamental understanding of how synapses are formed and specified. Let me explain this a little bit better. What you see here is a schematic view of how the brain circuits develop. Initially, during development, there's neurogenesis. Axons and dendrites develop. Most of that occurs only during development. Synapse formation, on the other hand, occurs throughout life. I schematically divide synapse formation here in the initial formation of a contact and into the process that organizes the canonical elements, such as the release machinery of synapses, as well as the processes that convey onto synapses, confer onto synapses specific properties, such as the ability to undergo LTP. Synapse formation is in a continu con continuous equilibrium with synapse elimination. And together, they determine how information is processed by specific circuits in the brain. We hypothesize that there must be specific molecules, that there must be a molecular logic that guides this overall process. But we don't really understand that logic at this point. I believe that synapse formation, broadly defined here, both as the actual formation of the contact as well as the process that endows synapses with specific properties, that synapse formation like that is a classical cell biological problem, that it basically is guided by signaling pathways that are activated by cell surface receptors and then result in the organization of specific structures. Because synapses are intercellular junctions, such cell signaling processes most likely are mediated by cell adhesion molecules, which we all know are signaling molecules that connect 
cells at a junction with each other. As it turns out, we have actually at this point quite a few such candidate cells, adhesion molecules at synapses that are illustrated schematically again in this slide here. Among others, there are the neurexins and the lao type phosphatase and phosphate receptors, as shown here, which are presynaptic and are kind of hub molecules that interact with a lot of postsynaptic molecules. There are a ton of postsynaptic molecules. What is obvious is thus that already at this point, there is a wealth of molecules, but what we don't know is which ones of these are actually going to be central, which ones of these are bystanders, which ones of these do what. And how do these molecules, in their various functions, establish synapses? How do they decide what synapse properties should be there? In my talk today, I will focus on one particular family of these molecules because I think they illustrate best what I call the molecular logic that determines synapse properties. And also because these molecules, the neurexins, are arguably the best understood molecules at the synapse as cell adhesion molecules. So what I'm going to talk about is neurexins as anchors that organize transsynaptic signaling platforms, which in turn control synapses. And to start off with, let me introduce neurexins so you have a feeling for what I'm talking about. Neurexins are cell adhesion molecules that have the classical structure of cell surface proteins as illustrated here. They come in two flavors, alpha neurexins and beta neurexins transcribed by three genes. In addition, one of the three genes makes the third form, gamma, as shown here at the bottom. These three genes have independent promoters for these isoforms, so that there are six principal neurexins in total. Neurexins are localized to synapses, as I already mentioned. This is illustrated here in this slide, which shows co-localization on top of neurexin 1 with a presynaptic marker and adjacent localization on the bottom with a postsynaptic marker, demonstrating that these are synaptic proteins, at least in part. Recent studies in collaboration with Xiao Wei Zhuang's lab revealed that in a synapse, as illustrated here by super-resolution microscopy, that in a synapse, neurexins are not uniformly present in the synapse, but that they are organized in a subdomain. Each of these green puncta is the neurexin. The red labeling, as shown here, is a postsynaptic marker called HOMA. What you can see is that the HOMA molecule is distributed across the postsynaptic density, but the neurexin is present as a cluster. This cluster, shown here in more greater detail, contains approximately four to five neurexin molecules that are then put together in a microdomain. The size of this microdomain, as analyzed here both in cultured neurons and in slices, occupies about 10 to 20 percent of the total synapse. And this microdomain is positioned within the synapse in a manner that changes as a function of the synapse maturation, which can be measured as a radial displacement. So in vitro from DIV 18 to 26, it moves outwards from the center to the periphery, as it does in vivo from P14 to P28 in hippocampal. Uh, sections. So these experiments reveal that neurexins are within synapses part of a subdomain, suggesting, or rather confirming other people's studies, such as Tom Blumpeet's, that synapses are not homogeneous junctions, but instead are organized into specific segments. 
Importantly, neuroaxons have been linked by mutations to neuropsychiatric disorders, in particular autism and schizophrenia. What is interesting here is that it's, this occurs primarily for the neuroaxon 1 gene. The neuroaxon 1 gene is a huge gene, two megabases approximately. And all of these mutations are, technically speaking, CNVs, fundamentally deletions. The distribution of these deletions is illustrated here in this slide showing that they are not uniformly present in terms of their extent, but that they vary in extent over a great range. This apparently is a very dynamic locus. And in these hundreds of mutations that have been observed, the extent of the deletion is quite different. What is most important here, however, is that the deletions do not cause a similar clinical presentation in different patients, but are associated with a large number of different presentations. They're associated with autism, schizophrenia, Tourette syndrome, very importantly, intellectual disability, in a manner that we don't understand. We wondered, in fact, whether these deletions would actually have a functional impact on neurons and synapses since they are always heterozygous. The diversity of phenotypes suggests there may be genetic background effects or that this may be a rather minor constituent of an overall disease process that's unrelated. So to test this in more detail, we made conditional mutations in embryonic stem cells that allowed us to look at this in an isogenic background. As you can see here in this slide on the top, these are images stained for, of neurons, human neurons stained from MAP2 that either control, contain a functional neurexin 1 gene or neurexin 1 heterozygous loss of function. As you can see here at the bottom, this heterozygous loss of function results, not surprisingly, in a decrease of the mRNA levels, partial. So the issue then was, would this cause a change in synaptic transmission? And it does, despite the fact that the decrease is only about 40 to 50 percent in this heterozygous mutation, there is an equivalent decrease in the frequency of spontaneous synaptic events, as shown here, without a change in the amplitude. And there is an equivalent decrease in the strength of evoked synaptic transmission, as shown here on the right. So these experiments validate the functional importance of these heterozygous mutations and suggest, indeed, that the neurexin 1 mutations are associated with clinical presentations because they cause a change in synaptic functions. But they do not explain what the actual relation is and in particular, they leave open the puzzling question of why the same mutations in different individuals causes different presentations. Another feature of neurexins that I think is noteworthy, and in fact is the central part of what I'm going to tell you about today, is that neurexins are extensively alternatively spliced creating thousands of isoforms. These isoforms have been validated by packed biosequencing of individual mRNAs, so they truly exist. They result, as shown here schematically, from the alternative splicing of neurexins at six canonical sites in which small sequences are inserted or deleted. Alpha neurexins have all six sites. Beta neurexins have only two of these six sites. And as a result of combinatorial diversity, this creates the isoforms. And it will ask the question whether there is a in sort of a computational a coding sense of these uh, alternative splicing events or whether they are more or less random. In other words, do these alternative splicing events represent a code that we can associate with a given type of neuron, or are they randomly distributed between neurons? 
And so to address this question, some time ago, we used single cell mRNA measurements in which we analyzed alternative splicing quantitatively by RT-PCR of the cytosol of single cells. I won't go into detail here because it may be a little bit too much to discuss each individual splice site. I just wanted to illustrate to you that for the principal neurexins, although they always seem to be co-expressed, as shown here on the left, in individual cells, demonstrated for parvalbumin CCK positive interneurons of the hippocampus, the precise levels and ratio of different alpha and beta neurexins is already characteristic for a particular type of neuron. When we then analyzed in the same types of neurons, these sites of alternative splicing for neurexin 1 and 3, you can see that there is a dramatically different pattern between these various neurexin splice variants and neurons, suggesting that each type of neuron has one particular pattern of alternative splicing. What I would also like you to note is that in each case, Alternative splicing in a given cell is not all or none. It is always in between. This is important because what it means is that a site of alternative splicing is an analog signal. It increases the information content of alternative splicing dramatically. There's always a certain percentage of protein that's in, a certain percentage that's out for a given site. And thus, the coding diversity is increased significantly. Another feature that is important here is that although neurexins are highly homologous and have identical sites of alternative splicing, they are not coordinately alternatively spliced. In other words, the regulation of alternative splicing is not such that splice site 4 in neurexin 1 and 3 is always the same. Let me illustrate this point namely the lack of coordination, a little bit further because it is really important. What you see here in this slide is a plot of the relation of alternative splicing at one particular site, splice site number four, in two different neurexins, one and three. And you can see on the left out and on the right in for neurexin one, top, in, bottom out for neurexin 3. And you can, this is what's done for two different types of neurons. Neurons that project from the prefrontal cortex to the nucleus accumbens and neurons that project from the thalamus to the nucleus accumbens. For the prefrontal cortex neurons, there's coordinate alternative splicing in that neurexin 1 and 3 splice at 4 are predominantly out in both. However, for the thalamic neurons that project to the nucleus accumbens, neurexin 1 is predominantly out, but neurexin 3 is predominantly in. And there's quite a diversity between neurons. This illustrates what I mean with code. There are individual variations between specific neurons, but overall there is a mean that represents a specific pattern for each type of neuron and each combination of splice site. The non-coordinated gradual alternative splicing of homologous sites in neurexin suggests that this is, represents functional diversification among neurexins. On top of this, there's evidence from the laboratories of other investigators, unfortunately not mine, that this alternative splicing is dynamic, is activity dependent, that it changes as a function of activity, especially in the hippocampus. My talk today will in particular deal with the functional implications of the neurexin alternative splice code. Finally, not surprisingly, neurexins have transsynaptic binding partners, ligands. As it turns out, they have many. Maybe that is not unexpected given the large size of neurexin 1, 2, and 3 alpha molecules and their modular domain structure. But still, 
it is amazing what kind of molecular network emerges. What you see here again schematically is a representation of a subset of these ligands. These ligands bind to neurexins via interactions that are often regulated by alternative splicing. As a result, the precise state of neurexin complexes depends on alternative splicing and can be modulated by alternative splicing. I won't go into the ligands here today. This is the subject of another talk. Each one of these ligands has their own history and their own biology. I just wanted to mention that neurexins are remarkable for the fact that none of these ligands actually shares a structural motif or any similarity. They probably all signal in very different pathways. As a result, these ligand interactions are presumed to diversify the out readout of a transsynaptic signaling by neurexins beyond what is often observed in other ligand pairs. With these introductory remarks, I hope I have illustrated to you that neurexins are likely important presynaptic cell recognition molecules. I now want to tell you about the major story that I wanted to illustrate to you today, which deals with the alternative splicing of neurexin at splice set number four. We're dealing here with neurexin 3 alpha and 3 beta, and specifically we asked in this project, what is the function of the total neurexin gene? Initially, this was not a project geared toward alternative splicing, but we wanted to simply ask, why does the gene have so many isoforms, two different promoters? And in order to address this, we generated conditional knockouts that delete every transcript. We analyzed them in cultured hippocampanions. And when we did this, and we looked, at, we compared neurons that expressed either a control mutant query recombinase or query recombinase, we found an unexpected phenotype, namely that amper receptor mediated EPSCs were decreased approximately 50%, but NMDA receptor mediated EPSCs were normal, as were IPSCs. This was unexpected because the fact that NMDA receptor EPSCs were normal meant that neurotransmitter release had to be normal and suggested that the decrease in amper receptor mediated EPSCs was due to a postsynaptic decrease in amper receptors. Further studies confirmed this. Many amplitudes were decreased similarly. Moreover, when we looked at the cell surface, at the synaptic surface concentration of an amper receptor, GLU-A1, as shown here, it was also decreased. Specifically, in these experiments, we label cultured neurons without permeabilization with an antibody to blue a one an AMPA receptor, then permeabilize and label them with additional intercellular antigens, PSD95 for the postsynaptic site, VGLUT1 for the presynaptic site of excitatory synapses. What you see here is the density of synapses is unchanged. There was no decrease in density, but the puncta size, which is a proxy for the amount of the protein in the synapse was decreased for the GLUA1 subunit, similar to the decrease in the amper receptor EPSC. There was a trend for PSD95. There was no change in VGLUT1. The decrease in amper receptor responses was not due to a decrease in amper receptor levels because, as shown here by immunoblotting, there was no change. This decrease correlated with the increased amper receptor endocytosis. So we wondered, how does this happen? Is this a developmental phenotype? Can we rescue it? And what sequences of neurexin 3 does it depend on? We used rescue experiments in cultured neurons, and we found that neurexin 3 alpha and 3 beta could rescue the phenotype fully, as shown here. However, the initial experiments were performed with one splice variant of 3 alpha and 3 beta, SS4 minus. When we did the same experiment for the same 
cDNAs containing SS4+, plus, the other splice variants, there was no risk. So these experiments showed that this is not a developmental phenotype and suggest that the possibility that alternative splicing may play a role. For us, exciting at that time because all this enormous alternative splicing, highly regulated of new exons, had never been shown to have any functional significance. And now here, there was the first time we actually had something. The site of alternative splicing in new exons at site four is extracellular. So in the next experiment, we tried to test whether this was an extracellular mediated function of neurexin 3. We fused neurexin 3 alpha and neurexin 3 beta, as shown here for 3 alpha, to a lipid anchor, so there were no intercellular sequences, no transmembrane region, and it's still fully rescued. However, when we used the splice variant that is secreted of neurexin 3, it couldn't rescue. Without membrane attachment, it didn't suggesting that the cell surface of synaptic display of neurexin 3 alpha or 3 beta with SS4 minus was sufficient to rescue the phenotype. So the most important question at this point was, is it alternative splicing that controls the ampere receptor levels in a transsynaptic manner? In order to address this, we turn to mouse genetics because all rescue experiments are always overexpression experiments. There's an intrinsic problem with overexpression experiments because they can create gain of function phenotypes or loss of function phenotypes for that matter. And so we generated mice in which we had genetic control over alternative splicing. What you see here is a schematic view of part of the neurexin 3 gene, axon 20 is the one that's alternatively spliced at splice set number four. This axon has an unusual splice acceptor sequence. Basically, as shown here in the box under wild type, it has too many A's. So we corrected that, so to speak, and we converted it into a perfect canonical splice acceptor sequence with the goal of rendering the axon constitutively included, as shown here with this red I mean, uh, nucleotides that were the canonical sequence. And as it turns out, that worked. Norexin 3 as SS4 was no longer alternative splice, but constitutively included with this mutation. In addition, we flanked the axon by LOX P sites, allowing us to con considerably exclude it with Cre recombinase. Thus, in these knockout mice, Cre induces the SS4 plus without Cre. Delta Cree control, which is a mutant Cree, we have SS4+. Plus. As a result, we have perfect control of alternative splicing. When we analyze these neurons first again in cultured neurons from the hippocampus, we obtain exactly the same phenotype as we had from the 3 alpha beta knockout. As though SS4+, plus completely reproduced the total loss of function phenotype. There was a 50% decrease in ampere receptor EPSCs, whereas the SS4 minus, as shown here, was the same as an unrelated wild type control. No change in MDR receptor in EPSCs, no change in IPSCs. Moreover, we found that all other features of the 3 alpha beta knockout phenotype in the hippocampus were completely reproduced, and more, finally, that SS4 minus neurexins could rescue the neurexin 3 SS4 plus phenotype. So this seemed to indicate that this is indeed a function of neurexin 3 in the hippocampus to regulate transsynaptically postsynaptic ampere receptors. But we wondered, is this really a transsynaptic effect? Is it possible that cultured neurons are not quite reliable? Is it possible that there's low levels of postsynaptic neurexins? And is this really something that happens in a vivo, in an animal? And so we went to slice physiology to address these questions. We used a preparation that is illustrated here, where we stereotactically express e AAVs that synthesize either Cree recombinase or a mutant Cree recombinase as a control. We stereotactically inject these AAVs into the hippocampal CA1 region at P21. We wait two weeks, we cut slices, and then we perform slice physiology. What you see here is 
that the CA1 neurons are infected because they're green and the Cree recombinase or the control protein are fused to EGFP. We record from the subiculum because that is the major output target area for the CA1 neurons. We stimulate the axons from the CA1 neurons by stimulating electrode between the subiculum and the CA1 region. The subiculum contains two classes of neurons that differ in intrinsic electrical properties. These two classes of neurons are either regular firing neurons that fire action potentials regularly in response to current injections, or burst firing neurons that respond with bursts, very surprisingly with the name, uh, when you fire, when you inject currents. These two different types of neurons also have different types of LTP. The regular firing neuron have a postsynaptic classical form of NMDA receptor dependent LTP long term potentiation, whereas the burst firing neurons don't, cannot undergo NMDA receptor dependent LTP, but undergo a presynaptic form of LTP that increases neurotransmitter release and that is cyclic AMP dependent. So these two different types of neurons are otherwise quite similar. They receive inputs, they both receive inputs from the CA1 region, but they have different intrinsic properties and different forms of synaptic plasticity. So this preparation allows specifically analyzing presynaptic manipulations because you can manipulate the CA1 region neurons selectively and you can analyze the effect of such manipulations on postsynaptic responses. What we found with both the knock-in SS4+, plus, as shown here, or the knock-out with the 3-alpha-beta conditional, is that SS4+, plus in input-output curves, had an approximately 40 to 50 percent decrease in amperoceptor-mediated synaptic strength that was completely rescued by presynaptic excision of SS4 into SS4 minus, as shown here on the right with the green bar. So this totally reproduced the phenotype of the cultured neurons, demonstrating that this was indeed something that wasn't a culture artifact. What happens thus is that when we remove presynaptic neurexin 3 SS4 minus, either by deletion of neurexin 3 or by constitutive insertion of SS4, then postsynaptic amper receptors are decreased. They're internalized. The postsynaptic site is basically instructed to have fewer amper receptors, but a the same amount of NMDA receptors as shown here. It changes the nature of the postsynaptic response. There's more postsynaptic amper receptors internally. Based on this, you would expect that LTP should be enhanced because LTP consists in a recruitment of internal amber receptors to the surface. However, when we tested LTP in these same neurons after presynaptic manipulations, we found that presynaptic SS4 plus neurexin 3 blocks postsynaptic NMDA receptor dependent LTP and that this could be fully rescued by presynaptic excision of SS4. In other words, alternative splicing of neurexin 3 di dictates the postsynaptic competence for NMDA receptor dependent LTP in pretty much an all or none fashion. The presynaptic form of LTP in the other type of neurons, the burst firing neurons, was not altered. So the conclusion from these studies was that presynaptic neurexin 3 alternative splicing has a profound function in specifying the postsynaptic receptor composition in terms of amper receptors and postsynaptic long term plasticity. It forms a gate for postsynaptic plasticity. And thus, neurexin 3 in this particular synapse functions to specify one particular property of the postsynaptic response. The obvious question from these experiments then is whether other neurexins have the same phenotype. In fact, we could rescue this neurexin 3 knockout phenotype by overexpression of other neurexins, 
suggesting that they should have the same function. But as you know, overexpression always has, as I already mentioned, the potential for artifacts. So we wondered if Nurexin 1 has the same phenotype and maybe not very creatively, we did exactly the same experiment for Nurexin 1. We made exactly the same mutant for Nurexin 1 where we changed our turn of splicing as shown here now for Nurexin 1. It's exon 21 and has one exon more. And then um, we analyzed these mice. I'm not going to go into the details. It's exactly the same as I described for you for Nurexin 3. I'm just going to tell you the results of the slice physiology. And this result was completely unexpected and surprising. And it shows you that you can't rely on predictions based on in vitro rescue experiments. We found basically that amper receptor mediated EPSCs in these input output curves were perfectly normal. There was no change. You could have presynaptic neurexin 1 SS4 plus or SS4 minus. They were exactly the same. However, when we looked at NMDA receptors, now there was a totally different picture. Now we observed, as shown here in this input output curves in the middle, in the bar diagrams in the right, both for burst firing and for regular firing subiculum neurons, that the presynaptic SS4 plus actually enhances the response. So you now get an increased NMDA receptor response that is higher than in the wild type control and higher than the presynaptic SS4 minus. This is so because physiologically at resting conditions in a mouse, most presynaptic neurexin 1 is SS4 minus. As a result, the SS4 plus is a gain of function phenotype, as it is, in fact, for neurexin 3. So this suggests that very, very differently, now the SS4 plus is sort of the good one that does it. It enhances receptor responses but not for AMPA receptors, instead for NMDA receptors. When we look at LTP, again, we find no change in presynaptic LTP for the, uh, for the burst firing neurons, but for the regular firing neurons, we find, not surprising, an increase in LTP, because if you have an increase in NMDA receptor responses, you get increased conduction of LTP, so you get an increase in LTP. So these experiments, suggest that neurexin 1 and 3 have completely different functions despite their homology. This is actually quite intriguing given the fact that the alternative splicing is not coordinated, as I showed you. And it's also intriguing because it suggests that you can independently modulate postsynaptic receptor responses by differential regulation of presynaptic alternative splicing of neurexin 1 and 3 at this splice at number 4. It also suggests that plasticity is under control of alternative splicing as well, which has, similar to the, neurex, to the receptor composition, implications for circuits' responses for how neurons respond to synaptic transmission. As an aside, what I find intriguing here is that, as I mentioned earlier, neurexin 1 mutations have been linked to schizophrenia. In fact, to the best of my knowledge, they're still, although very rare, the single most frequent single gene mutation that has been associated with schizophrenia. And it's thought that schizophrenia involves NMDA receptors. At least that is my understanding from some of the literature. So the specific regulation of NMDA receptors by neurexin 1 SS4 alternative splicing may suggest a possible role here, a possible link to schizophrenia. So what I've told you up to now is that Neurexin 1 and 3 alternative splicing at splice head number 4 has profound but very different functions in controlling postsynaptic receptor responses. In the last bit of my talk, 
I want to ask the question whether that is what neurexins do. Is the function of neurexins 1 and 3 to transsynaptically control postsynaptic receptor composition? And if so, why do neurexins have all these other domains? Why are there alpha and beta neurexins? And moreover, why do alpha and beta neurexin knockouts, which I haven't told you before, but I'm telling you now, have such different phenotypes? So to address this question, we analyzed a different brain region for the neurexin 3 conditional deletion. And we find, surprisingly, that uh, there is a very different function. In this preparation, we use culture neurons from the olfactory bulb to monitor synaptic transmission. What you see here is an image of such neurons, a mitral cell that is huge in the middle, surrounded by granule cells, and we can reliably record excitatory inhibitory responses in these neurons. And when we did this for the neurexin 3 alpha deletion, as demonstrated here, there was no phenotype in amber receptor responses, no phenotype in MDA receptor responses, but a decrease in iPSCs and inhibitory synaptic responses that was quite profound. Further studies demonstrated that this decrease was not due to a change in postsynaptic receptors. Instead, it was due to a change in presynaptic neurotransmitter release. Totally different mechanism that underlies the synaptic phenotype of the same mutation. This decrease in cultured olfactory bulb neuron actually reflects a change in a very specific synapse in olfactory circuits, namely the reciprocal dendrodendritic synapses. We showed this by using, again, stereotactic injection of AAVs encoding either wild type or mutant EGF tagged Cree recombinase, as shown here in the left. We then cut slices two weeks later, as shown here, and recorded from the mitral cells to monitor these dendrodendritic synapses. What we found in these input-output curves is that there was the same decrease in iPSCs as shown in cultured neurons, validating the fact that this is a specific change in this dendrodendritic synapses and not surprisingly, when you analyze the behavior of these mice, obviously before you do the slice physiology, there was an impairment in smell, as you would expect, shown here by an inability to find a buried cookie. Poor mouse. Um, so how does this arise? What is the nature of the impairment here? What is the specifics? Why do these synapses here have a loss of inhibitory neurotransmitter release as opposed to excitatory synapse receptor composition. We tested whether the impairment could be rescued by the same rescue construct that rescued the phenotype in hippocampal neurons, and we found that it couldn't. Specifically, when we looked at neurexin 3 alpha with SS4+, plus, it rescued just fine. Moreover, we observed no phenotype not shown here in the SS4 plus mice. So SS4 plus was just as active as SS4 minus, very different from the hippocampal neurons. Moreover, we found that GPI anchored neurexin 3 alpha or 3 beta could not rescue the phenotype. So in this case, you actually needed the transmembrane region and cytoplasmic sequence of neurexin for the function to occur. So the mechanism must be different. How does it work? We went further in these rescue experiments, despite the potential artifacts due to overexpression, to delineate the, the phenotype. And we found that neurexin 3 beta could also not rescue. So this is an alpha-specific phenotype where you need both the cytoplasmic sequences and some alpha-specific sequences. In fact, what these rescue experiments indicated is that overexpression of neurexin 3 beta is dominant negative in these neurons as confirmed here on the right when we overexpressed it in wild type neurons. What domains thus mediate the effect? 
Now, when you look at New Axon 3 Alpha, as shown here on the left top domain structure, it has this six LNS domains, three, L, B, uh, three EGF like repeats. Only the six LNS domain is also present in beta neurexins. We systematically analyzed which LNS domains might be involved and found that the second LNS domain, single LNS domain, fused to the cytoplasmic sequences of neurexin 3 and its transmembrane region was fully able to rescue the phenotype. So here then again, it's a modular function. One LNS domain now rescues the phenotype. It's an LNS domain that's not present in neurexin 3 beta, which explains the inability of neurexin 3 beta to rescue the phenotype. So it's a, basically a completely different mechanism, completely different function. However, despite being completely different, the LNS2 domain shares with the LNS6 domain the feature that it is also alternatively spliced. In this case, there's two variants that differ by a few amino acids, as shown here, 2A and 2AB. So we tested whether rescue of the phenotype with the neurexin 3 alpha LNS2 domain dependent on alternative splicing. And we found reminiscent of the AMPA receptor phenotype in hippocampal cultures that here for SS2, only the SS2 minus rescued, but not the SS2 plus. So what we have here again is a complete control of a function by alternative splicing. But it's just a different domain, different function. How does this work? What are potential mechanisms of how it might work? Well, it turns out that many years ago, we observed that neurexins form a stoichiometric complex with bistroglycan, a cell adhesion molecule that is involved in particular in attaching cells to an extracellular matrix, but is also found in a subset of inhibitory synapses in brain. This complex, interestingly, was regulated by alternative splicing in LNS2. What you see here is that only LNS2 minus, as shown here in the single um, band here, actually binds. This is calcium dependent because calcium is a structural component of LNS domains. None of the other splice variants bound. So this was an interaction that was regulated by alternative splicing at SS2, suggesting that SS2 in this case mediates transsynaptic signaling by binding to dystroglycan. Gratifyingly, just like SS4, SS2 turns out to be highly regulated. What you see here is the quantification of SS2 in hippocampus striatum and neurons that project from the thalamus and medial prefrontal cortex to the nucleus accumbens in the striatum, of course. And you can see that in each case, there's a different pattern showing their yeah, regulation of, a, of this alternative splicing, similar to what I've told you about SS4. So this suggests that tight regulation of neurexin 3 function in inhibitory olfactory bulb synaptic transmission is mediated by regulated alternative splicing of neurexin 3, now at SS number 2. So to summarize this, what these data suggest is that neurexins are essential in these synapses specifically for the transsynaptic control of either postsynaptic properties or presynaptic properties, depending on the specific synapse we are analyzing. How can we reconcile these data as well as other data that I haven't had time to discuss suggesting additional functions for new accents with an overall conceptual model? And I would like to propose here a high-resolution model to sort of illustrate this. What you see here in red is new accent. And it has all of these features sticking out. We believe that neurexins are signaling platforms. 
that serve to coordinate multiple transsynaptic ligands. These ligands regulate, among others, postsynaptic amper receptors, LTP, release probability, endocannabinoid synthesis, which I haven't had time to discuss, GABA receptors, potentially, NMDA receptor trafficking, definitely, and other things as well. We think that that conceptually explains how neurexins work in a synapse. And in this manner, neurexins contribute to the molecular logic that determines the properties of synapses. This fits into overall synapse formation in the part of synapse specification, the process that endows synapses with particular properties. In this case, different synapses, different properties, such as release probability and receptor composition. Thus, neurexins are central control switches for a facet of synapse formation and that are complemented by other control molecules that needed other function features of synapse formation. There are many other features that come to play here beyond neurexins. In closing, I just want to mention that one of the neurexin ligands, latrophilins, which also bind to other presynaptic molecules such as tenurins and flirts, are in fact responsible for another feature of overall synapse formation. And I won't go into this. Let me just illustrate to you that latrophilins are distributed in neurons in a specific manner throughout a particular neuron and are essential for synapse formation, for the initiation of synapses as opposed to the synapse specification function so that we go through different parts of the puzzle that are contributed by different molecules in an overall network, molecular network. And I think that if we go along this path, we will be able to dissect, deconstruct the molecular signals that are responsible separately for the initiation of synapses at specific locations, for the organization of canonical features of synapses, such as release probability, the release machinery, and the specification of particular properties, such as receptor composition. And let me close by acknowledging major contributors. Most recently, the work that I discussed on neurexin one alternative splicing was performed by Jin Dai. The work that I discussed on neurexin 3 SS2 in neurons was done by Pang Zhu, both with the help of Justin Trotter and Jason Aoto performed all the initial studies on your excellent three alternative splicing at splice set number four. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, a tour de force, and we have time for some questions. I know some people may need to go, but others I'm sure would like to stay and engage in the conversation. There are microphones in the aisle. If you have a question to pose uh, to the speaker, uh, please go to one of those so people watching by video can hear you. And we can start right here. Hi. I was curious if you would like to come in besides splice variations, um, what do you know about the, uh, the diversity uh, at the level of post-translational modifications of some of these proteins and how that can possibly connect to the functional diversity? That's a very easy question because I know nothing. <laughs> I mean, obviously, post modifications are important, especially phosphorylation, but we just don't know. In the first part of your talk where you spoke about the single cell sequencing, you suggested that the effect of the splicing was a sort of analog signal. But in the second half of your talk, you spoke about each splice site as if it's a discrete on and off switch. So let me ask a specific question. When you turned on and off splice site number four, splice site number two, did you check that the other splice sites are unaffected? Great question. So we did check. We can't find a change in the other splice sites when we turn it on and off. 
For experimental reasons, we have to convert the analog into a digital signal because otherwise we need to have black and white, otherwise we can't look at the difference. That's, so, so I didn't, so, in no means did I want to convey the impression that physiologically it's always in or out, it's your, always somewhere in the middle. Your mouse has two alleles so you could turn one on and the other off. Yes, we could potentially do that. Very difficult, though. <laughs> yes. You mentioned about this effect of splice variants on the MPA and the NMD receptors. I was wondering what happens to the hundreds of other ligands at the postsynaptic side. Do you think they also might be affected in some other ways? So. We think that the alternative splicing of presynaptic neuroaxons acts differentially by changing the complexes the neuroaxons engage in. So I think physiologically what happens is that some neuroaxons are spliced in, some are out. At the hippocampal synapses in the control conditions, it's mostly spliced out for SS4. Under those conditions, these new axons will interact with different ligands than when they're spliced in. Uh, we think that this switch is what determines the change in receptor composition postsynaptically. But identification of the precise ligands is not that straightforward because there are several of them. So we don't actually know which ligands are involved. But the ligands the neuroligands, 1, 3, uh, do they interact with some of these splice variants? Good question. They all interact differentially. So neuroligands form a total subject for another talk because they are actually quite complex. They're postsynaptic ligands, but they're not the only ones. As it turns out, neuroligand 1 is itself alternatively spliced. It has a splice site B. The B plus binds to both plus and minus neuroaxons. The B minus only binds to minus neuroaxons. Okay? Neuroligand 2 and 3 never bind to plus. They only bind to minus. Okay? So it's complicated. It's not that straightforward. And there is a diverse interaction network. I think we have already experienced from beautiful studies in cancer biology how protein networks can be quite complex. It's going to be the same thing at the synapse, if not more so. Since you're yeah. the best expert, could I ask you the last question about the turnover rate of the synapse during development? I'm sorry, again? Turnover rate of the synapse. Of Tur the turnover of the synapse. So there's beautiful studies in particularly uh, from um, Professor Gans lab at at NYU demonstrating that approximately 10% of synapses turn over. 90% once formed are plastic in terms of their properties, but not in terms of whether or not the synapse gets eliminated. They stay pretty constant. Thank you. Tom, let me ask this. You at the beginning pointed out that deletions in Nurexin are associated with interesting phenotypes that aren't necessarily breeding true in terms of autism and schizophrenia. Is it possible to study these same parameters now with human iPS cells differentiating them into organoids and trying to understand how such uh, changes uh, in deletions might affect in human cells uh, what's happening, or is that system not yet ready for that? I think the organoids have a long way to go because the neurons in these organoids have, to this point, never been shown to actually form synaptic circuits. They have not. They have not, no. So there is great excitement. I think organoids will be fantastic models for early developmental impairments. Schizophrenia and autism are probably not early developmental impairments. They're probably in synaptic networks that are quite matured. As a result, I think that we can use cultured human neurons probably as better, more reproducible systems, especially scaling up to examine features to potentially look for therapies. 
there's a chance that that's going to be possible to do. I think organoids at this point have a long way to go, also because of this incredible variability. It's, it's very, very high variability. Having said this, however, I do think that we need to push organoids because they are so powerful, potentially, if one could get them to the point where they would actually form some kind of circuit, that would be terrific, yeah. Well, we can continue the conversation in the medical library for those of you interested in coming to uh, continue to chat with Professor Sudoff. Meanwhile, let's thank our speaker again for a wonderful presentation.